Hey everybody, how's it going? Thank you for listening to the WhatCast. We're still here. Still here, still us. Still here, still us. You're still used. You're still listening. And that's awesome. Or or maybe you're new and that's awesome too. So if you if you're new, hi. We're we're the WhatCast. And if you're not new, welcome back. You're awesome. So are you new listener? Thank you for sticking around. If you're still listening, if you haven't given up already, please. I'm just kidding. I'm not going <laughs> to. <laughs> Stay with us, you son of a bitch. <laughs> so what are we going to talk about tonight, Mike? You you mentioned a name that should be familiar to uh, some people, and I'm excited to hear what you got. So there there's this, there's this guy, or this guy, this author. He's written probably 12 million books at this point, but his, his name's Brad Steiger. And, uh, I, I've was going through, I, I, I've mentioned on the show, I, I recently moved. Well, at this point it's been a few months, but, um, I've, I've, I've finally been able to get all my books out and, and, and I've got my own little library office studio thing. And, uh, so I, I've been able to go through books that I haven't seen in, literally a decade or more and uh so it, it's it's given me a lot of material for the show because i i now have access to all my stuff and i found this I, i've got a few books by brad steiger but i found this one book called the awful thing in the attic and just just the title of the book is is you know it, it's pretty scary sounding it leaves an impression on the imagination the awful thing in the attic but what this book is is basically um chronicles of some stories that he personally investigated and he he talks about the investigations that he goes through and and kind of he puts it in it's it's like he's telling the story of of what happened it's not it's not so much a report it's it's his retelling of of the events as they happened so so I was looking through that and and I found a few stories that I that I thought would be fun to share. Um I've got two haunted house stories and this weird alien UFO encounter thing. Um but for anyone who's not familiar with with Brad Steiger, he's like I said, he's he's a prolific author. He's written so many books on the paranormal and cryptids and and UFO encounters and just basically the bread and butter of the what cast he has written books about it he's like uh i guess if you're familiar with like nick redfern he's he's like as prolific as that he, and right. he's been around forever he's been doing investigations since i believe the 70s or maybe even the 60s he's he's you know like uh i i would say he's a more believable version of ed and lorraine warren maybe yeah. You know, they're not they're not making movies on his investigations. He's not selling the rights to movie companies. He's just writing books about it. Yeah, if you if you have shared a history like like ours like reading books at the li- everything you can get your hands on, books at the library, books at school about the paranormal, you've probably read a couple of his books. If you if you don't recognize his name, you've probably read a couple of his books and don't know it. Yeah, he's he's just written so much. Like any topic that we've covered he's probably written a book or at least devoted a chapter to right so so what what do you want to hear first you want to hear the weird alien story you want me to talk about haunted houses oh let's make a spooky sandwich haunted house aliens haunted house i'm I'm liking the break from alien stuff i i like the ghost stuff the 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 good thing about this is it's it's one of the weird alien ones it's not like a typical like like gray alien or or you know reptoid encounter it's it's one of those weird alien encounters yeah, yeah. which i fucking love yeah. yeah all right so the first story i'm going to cover took place this this was an investigation that Brad Steiger did in 1970 
So I guess he has been around since the sixties. I guess that, that, yeah. But, um, this, this case took place in Lincoln, Nebraska. And, uh, he was kind of, he was tipped off to this case by a local reporter named Dick Mezzi who had contacted him and, and he sent him pictures of this. It was in the basement. There was, it looked like a face of a baby that was on the wall of the basement. And he sent Brad Steiger this picture and, and that's all. He didn't tell him anything about this place. He just said, take a look at this picture. Tell me if this is of interest to you. And if you want to investigate, let me know. So he takes a look at the picture and, uh, it's weird enough to him that he's like, fuck, I guess we're going to go investigate. This is, this is kind of a, a creepy thing. And, and apparently this place is haunted. So for, for, for privacy of, of the people involved, he changed the names, but, uh, for, for the purposes of this story, he refers to this place as the Richard house. It's owned by Mr. And Mrs. Richard and their daughter who at the time was in her early teens, which to me, that's, it's significant, but, but I'll get into that later. But he, uh, Brad Steiger rolled up with this reporter, Dick Mezzi, and a few other people, including a psychic who's, who's somewhat famous. Her name is Irene Hughes. Are, are you familiar with that name? Uh, I don't pay too much attention to psychics, so I, w- I wouldn't be. I honestly don't either. Yeah. But she's, uh, she was, I don't know if she's still a, a psychic of renown, but in the 70s, she was apparently like a, a psychic of renown and a medium. And uh, she accompanied Brad Steiger on, on a lot of these investigations. Um, but they, they came up to this this woman's house but they had to get there within a certain time period. They wanted to get there after dark, but they had to leave there before 10 o'clock because her husband was coming home and her husband didn't want, like, he was one of those guys that's like, if we ignore it, it'll go away. Like, it's not real. Like, just let's not talk about it. One of those type of guys. So so she was, you know, they, they had a, a, a small time frame to get in there. So they go in. Brad says as soon as they get in there they they have that like oppressive feeling and anyone who's who's kind of sensitive to that sort of thing or is who's been in a place that has been able to to feel the presence of of something you can you know what that feels like like you you walk in and it's just this kind of over I I don't even know how to say it like it almost feels like like you, you have a blanket thrown over you kind of but you know, obviously you don't. It feels like depression. Kind of, yeah. It's just like this this overwhelming... Um, Uneasy feeling. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's the best way to feel it. Like, almost like your, your fight or flight response is just like on a hair trigger. Like, just ready to go off at any second. But uh, he said they felt that as soon as they walked in. They, they didn't know the full story. When when they got there, they all that all that Brad Steiger saw was this picture of this baby face on a wall in the basement. So they come in, they they meet Mrs. Richard and her daughter, Melody, and her daughter seemed to be he said when when they first met her, she seemed to be teetering on the edge of like hysteria. She's like or or shock, I guess. She seemed very kind of like emotionally withdrawn and distant and very like would would mumble responses, wouldn't really talk, wouldn't really make eye contact and just kind of seemed like at any moment she could go off or go into the like a trance state or be possessed, he said. And, you know, he's, he's researched a lot of stuff so he he kind of i think would be he's familiar with that sort of state like if someone is um yeah you know, and especially working with psychics and mediums he would be able to see someone who's about to go into this trance state or or call something forward to to communicate and he said that she seemed to kind of be teetering on that edge but th- you know that could also be fear and uh having just having 
experienced all this crazy shit at such a young age. Right. But um, uh, most of the stuff that happens in this house happened in the basement. And Mrs. Richard said even during the day she will not go down in the basement alone. And at night she won't even go down there. But they, they convince her and her daughter to go down with them. And they all go down into the basement. They, they started interviewing Miss Richard in this room in the basement. And while they were interviewing her, some of the some of the team were inside the room. Brad Steiger was inside the room with Irene Hughes talking to her about what's going on in the basement. And there was an, an, another group, including Dick Mezzi, who uh, was out there with with a couple other people outside of this room. And while while Miss Richard was being interviewed, this door to this room kept slowly closing and they didn't notice inside the room but the people outside the room kept noticing and at one point they put their foot in front of the door to prevent it from closing and they said they thought the door was going to break because of the pressure that was being exerted on the top of the door to get it to close (sighs) but it it wasn't enough to make it slam though it was being really discreet about it slowly closing so uh, Dick Mezzi calls Brad Steiger out and starts talking to him about what's going on and they they take a look at this door frame and the way the door frame and the door is hung the door naturally if if it wasn't latched should swing open because it was kind of at a at a slant so for the door to close by itself it would be literally defying gravity and so they couldn't explain what was going on so they finish the interview they call they call Miss Richards out and and they they walk through the basement. They all go upstairs except for Dick Mezzi and and uh, this other guy Glenn. They stay down there, but they're they're going through the house again. And and Miss Richard was explaining what happened along with Melody. And things the way that things started was uh, Melody started she was combing her hair one day and she saw the shadow appear in the doorway to the basement. And it it was just a shadow. There was no figure there or no uh, discernible features. I should say it was just like the shadow of this, this figure. But then she started seeing this other figure that was only in the basement. Um, But he had, he was this very tall man who had long shaggy hair and a shaggy beard. And there was a, there was uh, some local legends about this house. And one of them was actual fact. And that was that there was a man who lived in this house who killed his wife with a shotgun. He, he shot her in the face with a shotgun. Yikes. Yeah. That was a proven thing that happened. It's, it's in the, the records and everything. The man got arrested, all that. Um, but another thing that was that they weren't able to verify was that there was a man who had lived there long ago who was the victim of a robbery and he was stabbed in the heart and then they carved a cross over his heart whoever had killed and robbed him and uh that was just a local legend it was never anything uh, they were able to verify but Apparently, this Irene Hughes person was able to pick up on that. And she didn't know all the details, but she said that um, there was somebody, there was a, a, a presence that was here who used to live in this ho- in this home. Um, and his room was Melody's room. And uh, he felt like he was at home there, so he he would continue to visit there. But she felt like he had been stabbed in the heart she didn't know about this local legend about this place. And, uh, the, the legend was that this person was stabbed in the heart with a, with a cross carved over it. And, and she felt that the, the presence that was here was robbed and stabbed in the heart and left to die. But this was his room. And a lot of times Melody would feel the presence in this room or feel, or there would be a shadow that would appear in this room while she was in there. And while the investigation was taking place and they were in this room, they started hearing this loud pounding 
it sounded like it was pounding from the basement onto the floor of Melody's room. And they could all feel the vibration. It was pounding so hard on the floorboards that they could feel the vibration coming through. And at first, Miss Richard and Melody both thought that it was just them experiencing it. But then they, they verified with everybody else that everyone else could feel it and hear it. And and they said it, it literally sounded like someone was underneath them hitting the floorboards with a sledgehammer. And at that point in time, uh, Dick Mezzi and Glenn, who were down in the basement still, they said that that door, uh, that they, the door that they were having problems with, that when everybody left, they shut the door and made sure it, it's like I said, the door frame was kind of hung in a weird way. So it was, it was kind of tilted. And in order to get it to latch, you had to lift up on the door handle to get it to fit into place and latch. And so they got it in place and it was, it wasn't going anywhere. And once all that thumping happened, the door swung open and they said it felt like somebody ran by them. Like they felt the brush of air as something ran by them and ran up the stairs. Jeez. And then through, through the course of this investigation, they start to get the, the whole story of, of what they're experiencing. So in the basement, they are occasionally the walls will drip blood and there've been occasions when they have turned on, they've turned on the sink and blood will run from the faucet. And Irene Hughes, the, the psychic and medium lady who's there, she, she said that this was, I guess, leftover emotional stress from the guy who had been stabbed in the heart and it was because he had died and bled to death and this blood was like a, a reminder of the way that he died but he's not trying to to scare them or do harm to them it's not something that he can control but he feels like home in their room and just wants to to stay there and be with them or be in be in the house not so much be with them but be in the house because that's what he feels like his home is and then she identified the shaggy, scary guy as the one who had killed his wife and and blew her head off. Hmm. And Irene Hughes also said, well, she she asked Miss Richard if she ever felt like a familiar presence in the house. And she said from time to time she would feel like she was being watched, but she didn't feel like it was threatening. Like she just kind of felt like somebody was was like looking at her or, or watching over her, I guess. And apparently it, it was her uncle and her father both check in on her from time to time. And maybe it's because of the presence of these other two spirits is kind of opening a way for, for her uncle and her father to reach through. But they're not so much there to... uh they they don't really make their presence known other than just the feeling she gets that they're around. And Miss Richard said that from she feels she just gets this weird feeling that her father is there sometimes. But she doesn't have you know, she doesn't actually see him, but she gets that feeling. But Melody would she had things that would turn up missing that she couldn't explain. Like a pair of pants that she wanted to wear just wouldn't she couldn't find them anywhere and she would look everywhere and then uh, they would just kind of turn up under her bed, just crumpled up against a corner under her bed. Um, she had a jack-o'-lantern once that she had carved that she had in the house that just disappeared. And then later she found it up on a shelf in her closet. Ooh. Like just, just weird shit like that would, would happen. And I, I mentioned earlier that Melody was was a teenager, a, a young teenager. And we've talked a lot on the show in the past about poltergeist activity and, and how that usually, for some reason, seems to accompany girls that are in that age, like, like pre-teen to early teens. For some reason, at that period, young girls seem to... to and and it does happen with boys too, um, but but it seems to be more prevalent in in females for some reason that poltergeist activity will occur, 
and and I know a lot of it, a, a lot of theories on poltergeist activity seem to indicate that it's like psycho or, or psychic activity, energy being exerted out through the brain like like a weird radio tower or something, and it's it's creating all this paranormal activity, but it's it's really just a manifestation from the adolescent. Uh, but I wonder if, if maybe this sort of thing could also open up or reach out to any presence that are, that's already there and give it more power to manifest itself. Like what if, what, because of the history of this place, there was a, a man who was murdered. Well, there were two murders there, a, a man who murdered his wife and a man who was murdered and combine that with with what's going on with this girl and and apparently she she was having issues at the time as well she wasn't getting along with her friends she was kind of trying to isolate herself from her friends and she was just going through kind of a rebellious stage and and was having a hard time and she was a young teen and and what if all that combined and and what if she had a, a a psychic gift and this is all kind of lashing out like like a poltergeist thing which is then drawing on the energy from these previous inhabitants of the house that either had murdered or been murdered and is drawing on that energy and bringing that out and combining everything together to create this haunting yeah or, yeah either by creating the energy or attracting that type of energy that that house has a recipe for attracting something negative. Two murders. Yeah, one was just like a random robbery stabbing. Apparently, like there it wasn't like a a, a malicious. Well, I I mean I, it's a murder, so it's malicious. But I mean it wasn't like like the other one where the guy shoots his wife in the face. Yeah, you know, but but still, yeah, two murders in one house, and then she's like opening a gateway to to her other relatives too like her her grandfather and her great uncle came through hmm yeah but the investigation itself it was they were kind of just looking into what was going on they interviewed everyone um they had the experience with the door and the thumping and uh Irene Hughes you know got got her sensations about what what this was and and let everybody know about it and did what they could to help but they're not exorcists or anything so they they it's not like they cleared the house they just kind of tried to put the the people that lived there at ease um kind of told them what to do to avoid the negative entity and tried to put them at ease about the the presence of their relatives and the man who was killed, that he's not there to scare them. He just feels at home. So um, they were hoping that that maybe that would allow them to kind of coexist. But that was that was the extent of that particular investigation. That's that's where they left it. They just came to that conclusion with the people that lived there. And and like I said, they're on a time crunch anyway. They could only be there till a certain time before. Mr. Richard got home and and got all fired up. Yeah. But it's pretty fucking pretty creepy though. I mean, it's got it's got all the uh the classic hallmarks, the bleeding wall, the shadow figures, the ugly guy in the mirror, like all the all the classic creepy shit. Yeah, it sure does. And isn't it kind of interesting looking back and hearing a classic story like this with the classic telltale signs of a a haunting? Isn't it kind of impressive of how much of a shared experience some of these cases are i mean we call them classic hallmark signs but geez yeah it's like almost cliche yeah you know like like oh of course there's blood dripping down the wall what what else would you expect but yeah it's it's kind of cool when it's when it comes from an actual case and it's not just like in a movie or in a ghost story. You actually hear it in a case that's being investigated. Yeah. All right, now for the meat of our spooky but, sandwich. Let's yeah, get to yeah. some creepy aliens. Yeah, so it's not just ghosts that Brad Steiger investigates. There, there was this one case 
Uh, now, now he wasn't doing investigating himself at this point, but this was a case that had been presented to him, and uh, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty interesting case, and and I think it, it's one of the more reliable cases. But this took place in De- on December twentieth, nineteen fifty eight, and it's a case that comes from the archives of the Swedish defense staff. And there were two two members of Swedish defense that uh, named Hans Gustafsson and Stig Rydberg, and they had this weird encounter. Um, it's it's I I don't I don't know why all of these like really fucked up weird alien encounters come from the fifties and sixties, but for some reason that was the only time that weird fucked up alien encounters happened. Cause you don't hear about people meeting dick nose aliens <laughs> nowadays. That doesn't happen. I, I wish it did. I wish there was more weirdo alien sightings, but, but this one, as far as weird alien sightings go, is pretty fucking weird. So they were driving from a place called, I, I'm going to butcher these names because they're Swedish names, but Helsingborg, from a place called Hoganus. And it was just before 3 a.m. And this thick mist rolled in. And it forced them to slow down to what would be 25 miles per hour on a highway. And they eventually came to this clearing in a forest that was in the the highway ran through. And uh, the forest was on both sides of the highway. And they saw this weird glowing light. And for some reason, they felt they felt this compulsion to get out of their vehicle and investigate what this light was. So they slowly walk towards this light that's glowing in the mist. And as they get closer, they realize that this glowing light was actually a disc shape that was resting on legs that were about two feet long. And they said that the the craft itself seemed to be made out of this weird shimmering light that would change color. So right there, I think that's interesting that they said that the craft seemed to be made out of light. Not that the craft was emanating light, but that the craft was made out of this light. But as they drew closer, all of a sudden, out of this, this glowing light, there were these weird floating blobs that just came out and they the way that uh hans described it he said that they were like protozoa and i for if you don't recall from from high school biology protozoa are a single cell organism but he said they were like protozoa but they were a darker bluish color so they stood out from the mist that was surrounding this light and he said they moved in this like hopping, jumping motion around the saucer, and and they seemed kind of like globs of animated jelly. And they only had time to register the fact that there were these weird jelly blobs coming from this light disc when they all of a sudden grabbed onto to both of Hans and Stig. They latched onto him. And they said they felt this powerful suction force that was pulling them towards this light. And they said that they, it, the force that they were exerting was, was, a, was extremely powerful and they found it hard to break. And they gave off a smell that smelled similar to burnt sausage. Yummy. Which is kind of gross. Yeah. I mean, usually you hear sounds like, or hear things like they sound, they smell like rotten eggs or sulfur, but but these guys just smell like burnt sausage. <laughs> and uh, Stig Rydberg said that his right arm sunk all the way up to the elbow inside one of the blobs, and he said it it seemed almost like the creatures could read his mind, and they were they were countering every move he made before he even made it. So it's like they were reading exactly what he was planning to do, and they would just counter that, you know, either get out of the way or move or whatever. And their strength was so great that nothing he could do could break it. So finally, 
he he was finally able to break free after after struggling against them and he ran for the car and two of these jelly blobs were following him all the way to the car oh no and he was able to he was able to put his hand on the the car horn and for some reason that the the sound of the car horn reacted with these blobs and scared him off for some reason it was alarming to them and and to me this this reminds me of this the symbiote from you know venom basically like how he's he's affected by sonic noise you know vibration and loud noise mm-hmm. affects it what if what if these were symbiotes and they're just like dude we want to make you guys superheroes like fuck you <laughs> get out of here we could have had our first superheroes and then they the aliens the the symbiotes just get in their ship and fly away like fuck you we don't we don't want to help you anyway they are not ready but the uh, so so as i mentioned Stig Rydberg was able to escape he sounded the horn and when he sounded the horn the two that were chasing him they they ran away and he saw in the distance Hans Gustafsson was holding on to one of the guardrails other well some of the other jelly things were grabbing onto his ankles and like pulling him so he was completely pulled horizontally and he was clinging to this post, and they're trying to pull him towards the saucer. And as Rydberg is is pounding on the horn, they they dropped him and floated back to their their shimmering craft. And then it shot up into the sky. And when it flew off, it shot out this really bright light, and it emitted this high pitched whistling noise, and then flew off and flew away. Now, the story, I mean, it's a crazy story, and it would be easy to say that this was a made-up story, but both men underwent hypnosis and spoke to a psychologist about this, and it was it was determined that this story that they're telling, they both believed it to be a real story. So to me, that makes me think that this is a real story, because if, if you have two people that are undergoing hypnosis separately and undergoing um, meetings with, with a psychologist. And they're telling the same story under hypnosis and when they're fully conscious. To me, that makes me think that something actually happened. Yeah. Like, it, it's weird they're trying to pull them towards the craft because this is even before, like, the alien abduction thing. You know, this was before Betty and Barney Hill. This was before gray aliens. These were weird blobs that were trying to pull them towards their craft. For for what purpose? Yeah, amoeba men. And why do they both? Re- yeah, why do they both remember it under hypnosis and they tell the exact same story? Yeah, you know, if you were even if you both were agreeing to hoax something under hypnosis, I would have to think that you would be able to to, you know, I don't I don't think you'd be able to continue lying under hypnosis. And tell the exact same story. Mm-hmm. That's true. If anybody's seen any good like hypnosis videos or pe- videos of people being hypnotized, it's it's pretty fascinating. And I, and I don't think they would come up with the same story under hypnosis. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. So, like I said, that wasn't one that he investigated personally. Um, it was one that was brought to his attention and he looked through it and, you know, investigated it in that manner. He wasn't actually present for the investigations, um, but it was something that he had come across and, and investigated the documents and everything and uh, included that in this book. But I I love those weirdo alien stories, man. Yeah, just like out. Just those, those one-off ones that, don't make any sense that just seems so fucking weird yeah even if it's got you know all the the hallmark signs you know again hallmark telltale signs of you know glowing disc ho- mm-hmm. hovering off the ground and it sounds mm-hmm. like a ufo and until the amoeba men pop out and have mega yeah. kung fu grip yeah they're giving you the suction of love <laughs> yeah but then what do you do with it then is it is it a ufo <laughs> I'm I'm sorry, Mr. Protozoa Alien. I don't find you sexy. Don't worry. It's not necessary. <laughs> you don't have to find me sexy. 
I like you plenty. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just weird to me that the the horn is what did it. The and I wonder if it was like just startling them with the sound, or if it was the the sonic vibrations of the 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 noise. I don't know. Yeah, maybe we should all start carrying whistles if we're in the yeah. uh, Alps. Yeah, just just carry a bunch of fucking gym teacher whistles. That's actually that's something I would take with me if I was going out on a hike. I know it sounds dumb, but I'd bring like ten egg timers. So if I something was following me, you just turn it to one minute and leave it somewhere. Throw it, throw it the opposite direction. So then it just goes off. And like, oh, what the fuck is that? Yeah, well, it's a good tool to scare the shit out of somebody. Yeah. Or, Suck on that, Yeti. <laughs> Don't <dumb> fuck. <laughs> Outwitted by a human, you stupid primate. All right. So the last one I got is another creepy haunting thing and this one when i was reading it it had a classic horror movie jump scare in it but it was like apparently something that really happened to this guy and fuck no that's no no just no (laughs) but anyway i'm getting ahead of myself this happened in 1962 and it happened in detroit michigan it's the adams family but it's only you know only with one D, not the classic Adams family. The Adams family had moved to Detroit, and they they had a couple of kids and a dog, and moved into this old gray house on Martin Street in Detroit. And the house itself was fine, except for this small room in the back. It was a, a bedroom, apparently, but it was only large enough that it would hold a bed and... A like a a dresser in the corner. That's that's all it could fit. But for some reason, this house or or this room and only this room was being occupied by some. Uh, I don't know if I want to say ghost or or I don't know. It's it's hard to really say. But uh, what had happened was Mister Adams worked the late shift, so when he would come home in the early early morning hours so that he wouldn't wake anyone up he would go to the back room and that's where he would sleep but he started having these terrible dreams that would wake him up at night and it it was just these dreams he he wasn't typically able to recall them but he would often wake up screaming in bed and he would always feel this presence in the room but he said some of the time he would have this dream where he would open a door and this mutilated body would fall out. <laughs> and it got to the point where he he just couldn't sleep. He would try to go in this back room to sleep and not disturb anybody. And he would just have these horrible nightmares and, and sense this presence in the room. But he he didn't associate it with the room. He thought it was more him and just like working weird hours and having uh, moving into this new place. So... In August of 1962, his grandmother came to visit from Georgia. She she came up to Michigan. And because they assumed this was related just to Mr. Adams, um, they let his grandma spend the night in that room. And the next morning, she woke up and she was shaking. And she looked like she hadn't slept at all. And she said that there were terrible sounds that were in the room. And all night long, it sounded like someone was trying to break in. And from that point on, she refused to sleep in that room anymore. Uh, And just based on what she experienced that first night, she felt so uneasy that she ended up leaving and going back to Georgia before her... uh, she, She had planned to stay much longer. And she was so terrified, she just... She had to leave. So then they, at that point, the Adams family was starting to kind of put pieces together and they would recall things that at the time didn't seem to really make much of a difference, like the fact that their dog wouldn't go in the room. They started to realize that when the children would start playing in the house, that would be the only room that they would stay away from. And they never said anything why, but they just, they they wouldn't go near the room. And they they didn't know what was going on. 
uh, because nothing else was going on in the house. It just seemed to be this room for some reason. So in October of the same year, 1962, uh, they had another friend come up from Georgia and they thought that this would be their final test to see if their friend could spend the night in the room without reporting any weird things going on. And uh, they didn't even tell him anything about the room. They just said, "This you can stay here, and this will be, this will will be, you know, your your room while you while you stay here." So he didn't think anything of his setup room. And uh, that night he went to bed, and he said he was in bed for just a few minutes, but he was facing the wall trying to sleep, and then he felt something kind of uh, apply pressure to him. And he said it felt like it was turning him over. And at first he thought that it might have been Mrs. Adams. But then he started to get that that fear feeling that we've talked about. Dun dun. Yeah, there it is. And uh, he started to shake. And, and as he was forced to turn, he said he saw a woman with long hair. And she had her back to him and was looking out of his room into the kitchen, which was beyond his room. And he said she looked like she was wearing a fur coat and a blue dress. And so he screamed at the time, and he ran towards the figure. And once he got up to where the figure was standing, all the power in the house went out. Whoa. So then he started stumbling around in the complete darkness of the house, and then the lights just came back on on their own. And then Mrs. Adams came in and then Mr. Adams came in because he was getting ready for the night shift. And then he tried. So so their friend was explaining to them what happened or he was trying to explain to them what happened when all of a sudden out of the room came this loud screaming noise. He said it sounded like a, a half human, half animal sound that just kind of came from their room and neither one of them neither mr or mr mr or mrs adams had ever heard anything like that at that point and they they felt the hair raise up on the back of their neck and there was a a heavy trap door that was used uh, for the utility room and that trap door all of a sudden raised itself into the air a few inches and then slammed back down and they because of that they thought maybe somebody was hiding down there so they checked it out and it was just like the, a small i guess access point to under the house like they didn't have a basement but they said there was a flimsy set of stairs that led to a partially dug out basement so it's i would imagine it's probably essentially a, a dirt room where the pipes go through right the the scariest thing is after after all that happened, Mr. Adams decided to give it one last one last time, <laughs> and uh, on he he basically said that he was laying out a challenge. This was going to be it. Tonight was going to be it. Was either he was going to chase this thing out of his house, or he was leaving the house for good. So he came home from the work on Sunday morning. And his wife and one of her friends were waiting up. This this was later in October. He decided that he was going to go lay down in the bed, in the back bedroom. He said at this point, it was 7.30 at night. And he laid in the room, and he heard movement in the room. So he thought that maybe it was his wife. And he said, he called out to his wife and told her that he better leave the room. And uh, he wanted to be alone to see if this thing was going to show itself. And there was no answer, and there was no further movement. But he said that he still felt like there was a presence in the room. So he turned over, and this is the part which would be like a classic horror movie jump scare. He turned over, and he said the face, there was this face that was inches from him. And he said it was the most horrible thing that he had ever seen. It had these eyes that just bugged out and stared past him and a mouth that was hanging open, and it was moving to talk, but all it was doing was hissing. And he Ugh. said it, it gave off this terrible rotting stench. And upon seeing that, as you would expect, he became completely hysterical, ran out of the room, grabbed his kids, 
ran out of the house and that was it. He said he did not go back there during the day or during the night at all. And in order to clear the place out, he had to make several trips during the daylight hours throughout throughout the next week to get all of his stuff out. Jeez. But thinking that uh thinking that this had been like this story, Mrs. Adams' brother and and her sister decided to come to the house to see if there was anything going on. And uh, her brother ended up going to the back room and said he was going to go take a nap to see if anything happened. And he laid on the bed for 10 minutes in the complete darkness, and all of a sudden he heard that awful groaning, moaning sound coming out again. And as soon as he heard that, he stood up, ran the fuck out of there, and that was that. <laughs> he said, <laughs> no, thank you. I'm having nothing more to do with this, and I'm leaving the house. That's hilarious. Yeah, so that's how that story ends. They they moved out, and, and their brother's like, you know what, fuck you guys, let me, let me check this out. <laughs> and then he had the bejesus scared out of him. And that, that yell was coming from within the room? Yeah. God damn. Yeah. Just the thinking about just some face with a gaping mouth and bulging, bulging eyes when you turn around. Like, that's fucking terrifying. Yeah, and as far as ghost stuff goes, you know, you'll hear noises in the house, things that are making noise, and you'll see something if it's a shadow or an apparition or a full-on ghost, but to hear something make a sound, a disembodied voice in a room, you know, that's... That's so scary. That's super scary. Just sitting there dozing off and have, you know, ah, just start. <laughs> That'd be so scary. Yeah, no, thank you. I will pass, please. <laughs> yeah, those those are the good old stories. The good stuff. Yeah, and he, I mean, he's got, there's a, there's a bunch more, so, you know, Maybe we'll we'll revisit this book sometime later and and talk about a few more of his stories. But he's got a ton of books, and and I mean, I I've got just right in front of me, literally at this moment, there's three of his books that I could draw on at any point in time for more show stuff. <laughs> so, um, if you've not read any of his stuff, highly recommend it. He's uh very entertaining. Like the the way that he writes his investigation, he writes them like they're stories. So it's it's really entertaining. It's a, it's a fun read, and uh, I don't just I I really enjoy his writing style, and he writes about all all manner of cool shit. So uh, yeah, if you haven't if you haven't read him, check him out. If you are familiar with him and haven't read this book, then you know check this book out. It's called The Awful Thing in the Attic, and uh, he's got stories in here about. Uh, people and animals that fall into different dimensions, uh, weird disappearances, other haunted house stories. Lots of cool shit. Yeah, now I'm going to have to find this book. I want to read about all of that. Yeah, flying jellies and all. Amoeba man. Thank you for listening to the Whatcast. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, iTunes, and YouTube. Enjoy the podcast. Get yourself a WhatCast t-shirt or a sticker pack. Who was that dude on that one episode? Try the links in homies page. All this and more can be found at www.thewhatcasters.com. Thanks again for listening and have a great week.